history is littered with stories of heroic deeds, incredible achievements, and as a result, fantastical people. People with more drive and power than seemingly anybody from their time. People whose influence and effect on the world at large was so defining, so important, that we remember their names even decades or centuries after their passing. But through the idolization of these historical figures, we tend to lose sight of the realities behind their lives. We distort their true personalities, tuck their flaws under the rug, and romanticize their lives. Whether to inspire ourselves, or simply to cope with the overwhelming complexity behind each and every one of these historical figures, we begin to see them as infallible, righteous individuals amongst the masses of corrupted minds like ourselves. We don't question these idols, because it's not the realities about their lives that drive us forward or motivate us. Instead, it's these romanticized stories and tales that humanity has fallen in love with. And to most of us, it really doesn't matter that George Washington didn't really chop down a cherry tree as a young man. Not unlike religious scripture in the modern age, it's the lessons and conclusions we can draw from these stories that make them valuable to us. It's somewhat fascinating in a world where everything and everyone is under scrutiny, where one small misstep can ruin your reputation forever, how much leeway we're willing to give to these historical figures despite the fact that they too were only human. So with that in mind, I thought it could be interesting to take a look at some of the most beloved idols throughout history and the unfortunate realities of their lives. And just to be clear, every single one of the people that I mention in this video have achieved more in their lives than I ever will. I'm not trying to denounce them outright but hopefully provide a little bit of extra context so the next time you hear one of their names, you think of the full story and not just the highlights. Walter Elias Disney is easily one of the most recognizable names in film, if not the most recognizable name in the motion picture industry. He pioneered the American animation industry, and his company, Walt Disney Animation Studios, is easily the most prestigious animation studio in the world. Due to the positive stories and imaginative nature of Disney's movies, it can come as a shock to learn that he was kind of an asshole. For one, he was virtually impossible to work with. Anyone who disagreed with Disney over even what were trivial matters ran the risk of losing their job. It has been noted that Disney fired a producer who had been in his employ for over two decades when the producer disagreed with Disney's choice of a film location. He has also been described as an arrogant businessman, a self-made tycoon, and a person with a large ego. You see, I believe Walt Disney had a vision. A vision he wanted to realize so much, he refused help or input from anybody who challenged his own ideas. People seemed to go along with it, mostly because of his status and accolades in the industry. But most of the 26 Academy Awards that Disney won throughout his career were basically earned off of the hard work of other people. Many of the films that received these awards barely if at all, involved Walt Disney in their actual production. He wasn't a very good artist himself. In fact, it's well known that he couldn't even sign his name in the style of the company logo that we all know so well today. Still, somehow he managed to dig his nose into each and every aspect of his company, micromanaging his great vision to align with his deeply prejudiced views. It took almost 60 years, but as of this year, employees at Walt Disney's two U.S. theme parks can finally show up at work with a stylish beard or goatee, but only if they are neat, polished, and professional, according to their official memo. However, at Disneyland in the 50s and 60s, even guests with facial hair, not to mention long-haired hippies, were turned away as they were told they unfortunately failed to meet the standards of Disneyland's dress code. 
In addition, Walt subscribed to a personal philosophy in which women were inferior to men and refused to employ them as animators, only to do the more tedious jobs involved in producing his films. And sure, one might think Walt Disney was from a different time and it would be unreasonable for him to live up to the standards that we expect people to live up to today. But there's more. Walt Disney was known to be part of an organization dedicated to ridding Hollywood of commies, the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals. Many of the members of this organization were known anti-Semites, which led some of the biggest names in cinema to turn down the invitation despite being anti-communist themselves, like Jack Warner or Louis B. Mayer. There are countless examples of problematic cartoons that Disney approved, in addition to the live-action film Song of the South, which has burned a hole in Disney's reputation since it was created. Walt himself has gone on record making some pretty controversial statements, such as using the word piccaninny during the casting of the Song of the South, as well as referring to the seven dwarves stacked up on one another as an N-word pile. There are a lot of speculations and theories when it comes to Walt's life outside of his films. But from what we know, Walt certainly wasn't a very good person to the people who worked for him. And even if his closed-mindedness truly is just the result of him being from another time, he failed to apply the same whimsical, uplifting, positive nature of his films to his personal life and the people around him. If there's one scientist in history the modern world has fallen in love with, it's Nikola Tesla. Amongst his greatest achievements were the AC current and the Tesla coil. He basically laid the groundwork for countless inventions that would follow after his death. But despite massive technological strides with his inventions, Nikola Tesla died a pretty miserable and poor man. Underappreciated doesn't even begin to describe it. The newfound respect for his work and the man himself only really began in the 90s. But one thing that people don't like to bring up is the simple fact that Nikola was a eugenist. Tesla wrote in 1935, The year 2100 will see eugenics universally established. In past ages, the law governing the survival of the fittest roughly weeded out the less desirable strains. Then man's new sense of pity began to interfere with the ruthless workings of nature. As a result, we continue to keep alive and to breed the unfit. The only method compatible with our notions of civilization and the race is to prevent the breeding of the unfit by sterilization and the deliberate guidance of the mating instinct. Several European countries and a number of states of the American Union sterilize the criminal and the insane. This is not sufficient. The trend of opinion among eugenists is that we must make marriage more difficult. Certainly, no one who is not a desirable parent should be permitted to produce progeny. A century from now, it will be no more occur to a normal person to mate with a person eugenically unfit than to marry a habitual criminal. One thing to note is Nikola Tesla's mental illnesses. He reported receiving messages from Mars or Venus from aliens, leading some to believe that he suffered from some kind of psychopathic disorder and showed clear signs of OCD. Nothing to be laughed at, of course but certainly factors that would be considered in a world that runs on eugenics. Either way, we can only hope that Nikola's prediction about the 22nd century is wrong. The story of Coco Chanel is a captivating one. She turned the world upside down, not despite being a woman, but because she was a woman. Because she saw the daily struggles that women went through during that time and began a movement to constantly challenge expectations and pave the way for new forms of expression. 
As a result, she became one of the most powerful and influential people of her time. She was known to mix with French politicians, with German military officers, and British aristocrats during the Nazi occupation of Paris. It's believed that Coco Chanel was in bed with the Nazis, both literally and figuratively. There is strong evidence to suggest that Coco Chanel passed on information as a spy to the Nazi party. When the Nazis retreated in 1944, she was put under investigation for assisting the National Socialists, but wasn't convicted at the time due to lack of evidence. Coco fled here to Switzerland, where she spent 30 years in the Hotel Ritz before returning to France and dying there. Eventually, she was buried in Lausanne, where you can visit her grave today. With her died the truth behind the extent of her crimes, and as one of the most positively remembered women in history, it seems that humanity is perfectly fine leaving it at that. Pablo Picasso was one of the most accomplished artists in human history. With his unique mixture of abstract composition and a mastery of the paintbrush, he helped found and expand upon numerous art forms throughout his lifetime. However, Pablo was not without his faults. Most of the criticism of Pablo relates to his mistreatment of the women in his life. He was an abusive husband, to the point where one of his ex-wives said this in a book about their relationship. His total absence of empathy and love, his lack of remorse and facile rationalizations for hurting others, a lust for seduction as a form of exercising power over women, duplicity and manipulation as a way of life, the pattern of idealize, devalue, and discard in every romantic relationship he's had, the underlying desire for control, an unshakable narcissism, and the drive to do evil by damaging the lives of the women who became his partners. She also mentions that he referred to women as machines for suffering, who either turned out to be goddesses or doormats. When asked why she finally left Pablo in the end, she famously replied, I am not a submissive woman, suggesting that the only happy relationship anyone could hope to have with a man like Pablo Picasso was an abusive, or at the very least, a controlling one. There are also numerous accounts of women stating that they were afraid of Pablo, and it's believed there are many who were simply too afraid to speak out against him. He's also said to have had a particular interest in young girls and might have even used a young prepubescent child that he and his partner had adopted as the model for his highly controversial and sexualized masterpiece, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon. He also took a liking to younger women in choice of his long-term partners, as his second wife was 27 at the time that he married her, and he was 79. That in itself doesn't have to be a bad thing, but coupled with the rest of what we know about his life, he would commit adultery left and right. At one point, he locked a woman in his apartment, and another time, he attempted to kidnap and hold one captive. We can only speculate what it is that this old man saw so enticing about impressionable young women. After all, Pablo Picasso was one of the most respected painters in the world, even whilst he was still alive. Many of the women he found himself spending time with were motivated by the idea of being the muse to such an important artist, and may have been willing to subject themselves to some pretty gruesome things. Unfortunately, even for his mistresses, things weren't different. As soon as they showed any sign of wanting to be freed from the controlling grasp that Pablo had on their lives, he tossed them by the wayside and dismissed them outright. So although his art will always have a place on gallery walls and in history books, Pablo himself was anything but a good man. He was self-centered, sexist, and controlling. I've only really touched on Pablo's atrocities he truly was a scumbag. Roald Dahl is behind some of the most recognizable children's stories in my childhood and many others. 
He had a way of creating fantastical stories, just like any children's book, but adding a certain dark humor to the mix that really made it stand out from the crowd. With books like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory or The Big Friendly Giant, he managed to create stories that would shatter the limits of a child's imagination while they were reading it. But sadly, it seems like the melancholy vibes and the dark humor that we've come to know from Roald Dahl's work is the result of a deeply troubled man. For one, he constantly cheated on his wife, who nicknamed him Roald the Rotten because he was such a jackass. Dahl is said to have made the lives of all his employees at the publishing company he worked at a living hell. He treated his secretaries as servants and tended to throw a tantrum whenever he didn't get his way. It got so far that when the company finally decided to throw him out, his employees got up on their desks and applauded him out the door. In addition to that, he's also gone on record saying some pretty offensive stuff, such as that Hitler didn't pick on the Jews for no reason, and that he had become, admittedly, anti-Semitic. These comments were the reason the United Kingdom's Royal Mint refused to make a commemorative coin in his honor, and in fact discouraged many from reading his books altogether. The truth is, Roald wrote stories that will forever have changed the hearts and minds of children everywhere. Who he was beneath all of that is something we would rather forget. No one person single-handedly launched us into the future quite like Henry Ford. His Model T automobile revolutionized the industry by giving cars to the average person. And his introduction of the assembly line changed manufacturing for good. He's often personally accredited with having created the middle class. But Ford was also a raging anti-Semite. His hatred for the Jews ran so deep that it's even mentioned at the Henry Ford Museum. He bought a newspaper in 1918, which soon started printing his anti-Semitic views, and eventually he even clustered them all together and published them in the form of a book named The International Jew, The World's Foremost Problem. It sold millions of copies and was translated into countless different languages. One of Henry's biggest fans in his heyday was none other than Adolf Hitler, who loved and admired him enough to hang a portrait of Henry Ford on his office wall, who admired and respected him enough to mention him by name in his infamous diary, Mein Kampf, as the only American left uncorrupted by Jews. Only a single great man, Ford, to their fury, still maintains full independence. And this isn't just one-sided love from somebody that Henry hated. Henry was ecstatic about this and continued to do business in Germany during the war to come. Ford as a company still stands today as a major player in the international market. It's safe to say his close-minded views were left in the past along with the man himself. Aristotle was the first real scientist in history. He changed the world with his advancements in philosophy and science and set Greece on a path towards advancement the world had never seen. And yet he too, though wise beyond his years and far ahead of his time, was not perfect. Aristotle not only failed to recognize the injustice of slavery, but in fact was an outspoken activist in favor of slavery. According to him, those born into slavery were better off remaining slaves, as they would be lost without their masters. He saw slaves as a subclass of human, living tools that were to be treated no differently than livestock. Though not the only philosopher in history to adamantly support slavery, Aristotle was extremely confident on their place in society, a sentiment which he extended not only to slaves, but also to women. In his mind, women were hardly even human. At best, they were deformed men. He made up claims about them having less teeth than men, 
not true, by the way, and how this somehow made them incomplete. He also believed that when it came to raising children, the woman's role was simply to produce or conceive the child, and that only a man could raise the child into a fully-fledged human being. And by that, of course, he meant the boys, as any daughter was as incomplete in his eyes as her mother. Mahatma Gandhi's name has become synonymous with peace due to his efforts in liberating India from the Great British Empire. The entire country of India, one of the most densely populated countries on this planet, would look incredibly different today if not for his efforts. He also fought against racial discrimination in South Africa, and he did it all without resorting to bloodshed or violence like most leaders did. Though he famously took a vow of chastity at the age of 38, Mahatma frequently would sleep completely naked with young girls close by his side, all in order to test his chastity. Though it was fine for him to do so, his followers were still to practice strict chastity, even to the point of never marrying. And if you had to marry, you were never to have sexual relations with your partner. Couples were segregated from one another to avoid this kind of circumstance and told to douse themselves with freezing water should they ever feel the temptation. All whilst he slept completely in the nude, night after night, with young girls. But it's okay, because apparently nothing happened. And mind you, he wasn't the equality buff everyone makes him out to be. His mission in South Africa isn't quite what it seems. He was famously thrown off a train for sitting in first class, which at the time was reserved for Caucasians. But Gandhi wasn't offended that he wasn't allowed to sit with the white people. He was specific, very specific, about how he was frustrated that he was seen as an equal to black people. The Kafirs are, as a rule, uncivilized. The convicts, even more so. They are troublesome, very dirty, and live almost like animals. Now, does this invalidate everything that he stood for and the great things that he accomplished? No, of course not. Gandhi will always be seen as a very important figure in human history, one that stands for peace, for compassion, and for love. Charlie Chaplin starred in some of the most memorable films in motion picture history, bringing a hilarious, whimsical persona to screens all across the world. Even today, his work is praised and admired year after year for his ability to relate to the average citizen, to put himself into difficult situations that people had to suffer through every day of their lives, whilst adding an element of humor and taking away from the sincerity of the issue at hand. The way he brought his comedy to life on screen, it's impossible to describe him as anything other than a visionary. But to say he was a good man may be a bit of a stretch. He was downright predatory, as two of his four wives were under the age of 18 at the time. One of the remaining two was 18, and the other, though 22, had given him the impression that she was 17. His first wife was only 16 when he married her because he thought that she was pregnant. She was an actress herself, and he was incredibly unsupportive. In fact, he thought that she was too young to have any real talent. That is, too young to have talent to be in a movie, but not too young to marry to have children. His second wife, Lita Gray, was also 16 at the time, but she indeed was actually pregnant. Chaplin tried his best to convince her to get an abortion, but when she decided not to, he repaid her by making her relationship a living hell. He cheated on her with countless other young actresses, he treated her like garbage, and demanded disgusting, revolting sex acts from her on a regular basis. Gray actually won over $800,000 in the divorce settlement, which seemingly ruined Charlie's reputation forever. But seeing as not many people know this story today, 
it's fair to say that didn't last very long. Like I said at the beginning of this video, the intention here was not to cancel these historical figures or to make you think that they're terrible people, but to understand that when we talk about figures like this, inevitably, there is going to be a cascade of opinion, of, of historical fact that does not align with what we today would be able to idolize or what we would want to idolize. The only way we can see these figures in a positive light is by ignoring these tiny details about who they really really were, because otherwise they're just more people making more mistakes for their own selfish reasons. And that's what all of us are. If you looked at some of the saints that we hear about and the realities about their lives, I'm sure you could pick apart all of them and make them seem like villains too. But the world isn't split in good and evil, like I've discussed on this channel before. In fact, the world is so much more complicated than that, and people are at the pinnacle of that complexity. The best thing that we can do for ourselves going forward is to recognize reality and make up our opinions after the fact, not to blend the two together. We can establish the reality of what happened, uh, what people like Coco Chanel really did, what people like Charlie Chaplin were really like, without letting it warp or distort our positive images of the story that we tell about them. 